session to be interactive sessions uh, between audiences and our speaker. Um, and therefore, we will be using the Pigeon Hole platform. Uh, kindly use your mobile phone to scan the QR code. Um, the passcode uh, for this session will be TBLC2024. Uh, uh, you can post uh, your questions on this platform. Um, and also, you can also vote uh, for uh, the questions uh, if you want uh, to bump up uh, you know, some of the important questions. Um, alternatively, uh, uh, if you're not comfortable using the IT technology, uh, we can go for the old-style um, uh, uh, Q&A session as well. Uh, please introduce yourself, uh, raise your hand and raise questions, and the microphone will go to you. Um, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you very much for joining us today and um, um, for this um, discussion on knowledge. We have, um, I think for those of you who've been attending this, um, this meeting so far, um, you'll see it's quite typical for a meeting like this, one focuses on the numbers, about billions here, five billion replenishments there. But ultimately, um, my without knowledge and being underpinned by knowledge. So this is what this particular event is about today. How do, we, how do we as ADB bring knowledge for the benefit of our clients? You may have heard we've had quite a bit of work reorganizing ADB. Um, um, I, um, I'm from the, the newly established sectors group of the, um, of the ADB. And we have, we've set ourselves a goal, actually Ramesh, our director general is here in the audience, which is to, our motto, as if you might say, is here in the title. Uh, we want to be a knowledge bridge. We want to bring the best global knowledge to our developing member countries in Asia and the Pacific. But so today, the challenge is what, what does that mean exactly? What does it mean practically? And I'm really delighted that we're being joined by um, an extremely knowledgeable panel um, from, different parts of the, um, from different parts of the ADB membership, um, both from um, maybe if I, can, if I can make the introductions already, um, maybe I could start with you, Rima. Um, we have um, Rima, who's from um, the Self-Employed Women's Association of um, India. With, please, please, please. Um, the Self-Employed Women's Association of India is um, a fascinating organization with, um, I think it's a, a membership of three million. When, we, when I first met um, Sewa and Rima um, in New Delhi just a couple of months ago, what really struck me so much was just the vast amount of innovation and thinking and opportunity you saw to give to your members. Um, I, I was so struck by a lot of the things that you mentioned, um, that um, to serve your members, you have to, we have to tackle some pretty big issues. We have to forge new economic pathways. We have to recognize that in India, um, I think you've mentioned that statistic I keep on repeating, only 90% of people work in the informal sector. A lot of efforts are focused on the formal sector. So how do, we, how do we forge these new economic pathways? That's what we'd like to be discussing today. Um, then if I could invite Bayer um, to the stage. Um, Bayer and I are old friends and have traveled in the desert together when I was country director in Mongolia. Um, and, Bayer, a former, de former director general at the Ministry of Health, um, and currently with the um, very esteemed Independent Research Institute of Mongolia, is one of the, may I say, one of the architects of this extremely interesting health sector reform in Mongolia over the last 30 years. It's a very knowledge-rich story, and today I think we'll hear how that happened, what sort of role institutions like ADB have played. So thank you for coming from Mongolia, Bayer, for, um, you know, to talk about that one. And um, um, Santa Maria, could we invite you to the stage? So Santa Maria um, has come in from, I think Helsinki, you came directly from Helsinki via somewhere. And um, Santa Maria is Finland's global ambassador for education. I think those of you who spend time wherever reading PISA studies will know that Finland is a very, very, very top performer on the, in the field of education. We work in education across developing Asia. We have very grand ambitions to do more. And we very often, um, 
at least personally, I've heard a great deal of interest in how do we learn from a system like Finland's, which is a remarkable set of statistics. I'm not going to tell it. I think um, Sanna Maria can tell a much better story than I can. It's the first system which introduced school meals, I think, back in the 1940s for everybody. Um, in um, coming from a continent where there's so much pressure on children to perform with little sleep and so forth, it really struck me, Sanna Maria, when we were talking, little elements like in Finland, the goal is not to put pressure on the child, to, have, to give the child a nice, easy time. And yet they are still top of the pizza table. So, um, you know, looking forward to learn how, how did you get there? How can your knowledge be applied in the context of developing countries in Asia? And Pilvi, may we? Um, Pilvi has come in from Turin, um, just south of the lovely mountains in, um, in the middle of Europe. Um, Pilvi is from the European Train Foundation. It's a dedicated, dedicated body of the EU which is responsible for um, skills development in the European Union, works a lot in, um, I think, in North Africa, in developing Asia, and is one of the lead bodies for the whole of the European Union to not just do training, but to think about the future. What is the future of training and things like climate and green technologies and, and, and so forth. So I think there's a lot of brain power here, just in the four just in the four seats. And um, to complement this brain power pool, if I could ask Ramesh, please, um, to, to come to the stage as well. So Ramesh is our director at general for, um, for the sectors group, um, who's been um, with ADB for, um, I think it's 26 years now, and has had a fascinating um, litany of um, a legacy. Where I think if you travel to many parts of Asia, you'll see many projects that um, um, have come to life because of Ramesh's work. So with him, he brings that experience of what can ADB bring to the table in terms of knowledge, fusing it with finance to great effect. So we have here a um, yeah, really very um, distinguished brain pool. We look forward, as Akapol mentioned, we would like to make this session as interactive as possible and um, really to get your guidance and very, and. I shan't be one of those moderators who talks too long. I'm here as a moderator, not a speaker, so I shall be very quiet very soon. But one very practical thing we want to get out of this session today is we are formulating for this new sectors group our own knowledge program. So we're actually listening, taking notes. What sort of lessons do we need to take back for our own activities? So um, it's not just chit-chat. Um, we will be taking notes. And um, I think we look forward to taking some of these big ideas of yours um, um, into, into practical action going forward. Now, Ekapol, what happens next? <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, um, as usual, I'm very disorganized. Um, so, um, without further ado, Rima, could I please invite you to... Um, talk a bit about your work, your perspective on this whole, um, I think, if you bring to life, I think, that supremely inspiring work that you do in Sewa, um, I think I would be very grateful and um, will be watching with all ears. Thank you. Please. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's a privilege to attend the 57th annual meetings of ADB, and I'll be talking about and sharing the knowledge on the reality of the living and working conditions, as well as the lessons emerging from almost 50 years of organizing these women workers from the informal economy, the members of SEVA in India and South Asia, but I would like to bring our members also into the room. I could not fly them all, but at least uh, I can bring them all into the room. Can we show the video, please? Come to come, but do a Maricari in Kadakaravio, 
Ve çeva yakarak. सांबर बहना ने ओरख मिली अग्रिमता मिली रोजगार मिले पहले हमें बीजा पर आधार रखता था अत बीजा हमारी पर आधार रखे Thank you so much. So I think these are the women workers who do not have any employer-employee relationship. They put in almost 18 hours of uh, work in a day, investing their own labor and resources and keeping the local economy of our country vibrant. We found that all of these women workers have knowledge that is useful to them and to all of us. The reality of these workers is that they are generally the poorest of the poor. The employment opportunities available in the informal economy are never constant due to severe macro competitions, changing national market trends, changing macroeconomic policies, and now further compounded by the changing climate. Their trades, inventories, supply chain, even the business models change nine to 12 times a year, which calls for tremendous planning. We call it as our adaptive economy in action. Their knowledge is perpetually in action, and 93%, Robert, not 90, 93% of the workforce in our country is in the informal sector. Therefore, at SEVA, we come together as poor, as women, and as workers to fight against poverty, but peacefully build a resilient future. We follow a joint action of union and collectives, where a union tries to give voice and visibility to the work of these workers. At the same time, we build a new economic pathway where the workers are the leaders. We build um, you know, a fairer and caring and nature-restoring economy. Our founder called it as building an economy of nurturance. Integrating women at all stages of the value chain is a key so that these women workers do not just remain workers at the bottom, but become the owners and managers of their own supply chains, of their own economic enterprises. Such an economy of nurturance is building peaceful prosperity, inclusive income activities, resilient results, and sustainable societies. So what does it entail to build such an economy? What kind of skills? What kind of knowledge? The role of education, skills, and its relevance to an individual's work and to the economy as a whole cannot be undermined. The knowledge of these women is also of utmost importance for institutions such as ADB in making its impact stronger, shaping policy dialogues, providing advisory services, and deploying financial services to the ones who need it the most. Currently, majority of the knowledge and the development models based on this knowledge are focused on just the 7% of the workforce that is the formal sector in countries like ours. 
But when over 93% of the workforce is engaged in the informal work, who are the wheels of the pyramid and contribute enormously to the GDP of the country, it is important that we mainstream their knowledge and experience in Asia. This has led to building a new human-centered economic model. It is based on practical work which shows some very good uh, outcomes and results. Such economic model follows the 100 miles communities principle that leads to equitable distribution of ownership of economic resources and greater control. We again call it as building an economy of nurturance. Such an economy would strengthen local markets and local skills and make local markets more accessible to women workers, thus strengthening the economic role of women. These markets will grow bottom up. It would increase the value of non-monetary work, including all forms of community and service work. Therefore, I think what is very important is to need to invest in bringing voices of the informal into the process of co-creating knowledge that strengthens the work and livelihoods of these millions of informal workers across Asia and the Global South. With climate change disproportionately affecting the lives and livelihoods of these informal workers, I think what is also important is the climate change knowledge coming out of the work of these women workers. What does climate change mean for them? How does it impact the informal workers? And what are the adaptation and mitigation measures? Such knowledge would help us in supporting these workers and their organizations to strengthen their climate action. This will naturally and most economically yet effectively bring women workers center stage and enable for more significant achievement on the climate front. So in the end, I would like to say that building knowledge on innovative climate which have been tried and tested, such as the parametric catastrophic insurance or the livelihood recovery and resilience fund. I would also like to add that dissemination of such co-created knowledge by these women workers, when integrated as a part of developmental programs, it helps in achieving global and inclusive growth while creating opportunities for skill building, skill enhancement, and skill diversification across Asia, including knowledge skills of use. As our president, Kapila Ben, who herself is a small farmer, and she says that for her, Seva is her university. When knowledge is created jointly by those who do the work, from their work, ready to use and targeted for transformation. And this knowledge is held in public domain by us for all who want to come out of poverty, extreme poverty or violent. Also at SEVA, we strongly believe in sister to sister learning and knowledge sharing, which is co-creation and knowledge sharing. I think this will truly help in building a just, dignified, and decent future of work for all in Asia. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rina. I think that's extremely interesting. I think what do you... Um, you know, you, I think you brought to life very, um, you know, very eloquently. I think the the work that you do with the uh, with, with your many members. I think what I really take away from that one is um, what you said about you know learn from learn from people like your members. Um, one one picture which really grabbed my attention on 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 your video was the salt flat, and um, I think we were talking earlier about heat. Um, with um, I, I think you mentioned these extremes of heat which people are now experiencing. I was just thinking, I mean, how long would I last? If I'm working there, I mean, Robert Chalham would be flat on his back very quickly, I think, it, you know, if working, doing difficult work like that in extreme heat. That's somebody's practical existence. And I, I would love to be in a position where, especially as we're talking about cooperation with Sewa, in a few years from now, we can actually say, you know, um, something that ADB did actually made a difference. 
um, and um, concretely. So thank you for really underscoring that, you know, as part of that knowledge, it's not just about research institutions or publications that ADB might come up with, but it's actually listening, learning from people's practical experience in the field. So thank you for the fascinating walkthrough um, in, into the wonderful work that you do. Um, now, um, if we could go, I think, Santa Maria, I think we, yeah, if you could talk us through, uh, again, Finland's wonderful experience with education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, um, ADP and, and our moderator, Mr. Scholhammer, uh, for the invitation to participate today in this event and a very, very good morning or good day to, to all of you. Um, I think I'm here also to learn and, and to share and a, a great admiration already now uh, from what we heard from Rima and, and looking forward also to to colleagues at the panel to learning from you. I promise to introduce uh, to you um, here today some of the most important building blocks of the Finnish education system. We come also from harsh climate conditions, but in our country it is, it, it is cold. And uh, I think my main message here uh, would be that thanks to the investments made in education, in human capital, Finland is a very different country today than it was a hundred years ago uh, when we declared um, our independence and, and also um, uh, survived a, a civil war. We have developed from a poor agrarian country to a democratic, high-tech welfare state and a knowledge-based uh, economy in rather uh, limited time. And even today, there is a broad consensus in the society that everyone is entitled to have the same equal rights and access to quality education, leaving uh, no one behind. No matter of their background, no matter of gender or social status. And every local school is a good school, contributing to the welfare of the children and of the community and then to the sustainable development of the society, our whole country and the world. I would like to highlight uh, just a few uh, important moments during this path uh, of 100 plus uh, years. First one is formal public uh, compulsory uh, free education uh, for all based on uh, public schools. Um, then maybe a second one that uh, Robert was already uh, referring to, I would like to take up here, is after the Second World War and our wars, uh, 1948, we introduced actually uh, a social innovation, which was uh, school meals, free school meals, warm school meals uh, for our, all. And today we lead together with France and Brazil and with international uh, partners, international organizations, a global school meals coalition, as school meals are a ma major factor in improving learning results and learning, uh, not to speak about health effects, and then also equality effects uh, in the society. Then maybe a third moment, uh, a major school reform in the 1970s, uh, where we unified our education system and also introduced a free uh, upper secondary education throughout the country. And again, a uh, few curriculum uh, reforms to meet the development of the society and the skills needed in the, in the society. As you may notice, however, we try not to do these reforms too often but rather leave room uh, for development in practice and at local level. And I think one combining factor here already that we had is the strength of the local communities and, and also uh, taking the lead from the local level. And uh, I would like to note that the reform in 2016 addressed, for example, digital skills becoming already then an overarching theme in the whole education uh, system. Um, and then uh, vocational education and training, the reform we did 2018, 
was important too, because it encouraged our educational institutions to work together hand in hand with the companies and with the municipalities already uh, early on. Um, and then to come maybe um, throughout the history, uh, but then also today, what are the key principles in our education system? What can we share? First, the equal access to all, then highly qualified teachers, focus on learning, focus on individual needs, focus on research and evidence-based um, education, decentralized system, autonomy, and then cooperation and trust. I have put in uh, on purpose teachers uh, on capital letters because teachers really are there in the center of our education system, all having a master's degree, uh, six year studies, and really carrying a lot of responsibility, I would say, for the development then uh, of, of individuals and of the society. Another factor maybe uh, which might differ from many other countries is the fact that we do not have, let's say, so-called regular controls, but we base on continuous self and peer assessment. So the system based on autonomy, teachers, dialogue and trust, and then the research uh, and evidence is there. I will come back to this a bit later or in the discussion. What has changed maybe um, when I went to uh, school, 1970s, 80s, black and white there, um, is the focus on, on really learning and supporting students' self-learning and also social skills. There's much more, for example, uh, group uh, work and then also technological tools uh, are used quite uh, widely as well. Yes, indeed, our school days are rather short uh, compared to many other um, countries. And the, I would say that it is the whole of society attitude and approach. Uh, we appreciate a balance between free time and study or work time. And in a way think that then we can also learn or work more effectively. And uh, yes, one can take it easy and should take it easy uh, every once in a while too. And like I already mentioned, we have quite a comprehensive education system, starting from the possibility to early childhood education, which allows both parents then to work to until doctoral degrees and also adult education and non-formal training uh, along the way. And here are some of the recognitions lately that we have received on a global level. Um, there would be more but we tend to be uh, modest people uh, in Finland. But I guess here also my main message is that education is a key agent to development. All this does not mean that we would not have any challenges um, or problems. And in Finland, as in many other countries, Lately, the PISA results have been decreasing too, especially after the pandemic, global pandemic. Uh, our response to this, the solutions to this, is increasing a few lessons also in, in basic education uh, in languages and math. Then technology is developing fast. Uh, the role of uh, social media also uh, very important. Here, I think we use technology in a smart way to enhance uh, learning. And then also when it comes, for example, uh, to social media uh, or, or media, the role of media is very important, also responsible media, but then also the literacy skills when it comes to uh, the use of media or social uh, media. So critical thinking, uh, very important. Um, and according, I think, uh, we also, we have the constant need for uh, the needs of the labor market, uh, constant upskilling and reskilling. I think on a global level, there is an estimation that about 40% um, of global workforce need to be reskilled within the next uh, five years. So it's important to pay attention uh, to this. And we in Finland, 
uh, want to raise also uh, higher education, doctoral degrees, and then also um, the current government, uh, the intention is to raise uh, uh, R&D uh, also to 4% of our uh, GDP. And here, you know, education uh, leads uh, to further education, leads to research, leads to innovations, leads to economic growth, and then uh, social stability uh, there as well. Um, digital uh, transformation, I already mentioned, climate change, green transition, circular economy. These are very much overarching themes that we put emphasis on in the education, starting from, I would say, early childhood uh, education. So going really in a strategic man manner across uh, the sectors. And maybe then to finish uh, building public-private partnerships and also people partnerships is essential, both nationally and at international level. And we know that education is very much related to states, to societies, to cultures, but we can uh, learn from each other as well. There are three things I mentioned there. First, just, you know, dialogue, uh, then uh, study visits, uh, and then uh, third, international partnerships with the support uh, with actors uh, like um, ADP, EU2, uh, UN, uh, very uh, important to us. And our Ministry for Foreign Affairs, the fact that we have an ambassador for dedicated for education tells us uh, also about the importance we pay to education and international cooperation, international development cooperation in education. Um, we are very re ready and willing to work uh, with our partners, uh, together with our Ministry of Education and Culture, together with our National Agency of Education. And there we have, for example, entities like Education Finland, bringing together public and private partnerships. And then FinSeed, which is a center of excellence in education and development cooperation. Uh, we are very uh, much looking forward to continuous uh, cooperation and participating in building bridges. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Santa Maria. And, um, Remember, when I joined ADB about a millennium ago, I think it was a long, long time ago, most of our countries were actually low income. Um, um, I think um, whatever, 20 some years later, now it is uh, most countries are middle income. The vast majority of those countries have concrete plans, aspirations to be higher income. And I was actually fascinated by what you said, um, Santa Maria, right up front, that we used to be, a, I quote, a poor agrarian economy and now we've transformed into a high income economy. And I think anybody who's been to Finland will see immediately, you know, it's, it's high. It's, it's a very prosperous, lovely place, happy. Um, and um, so it can be done. Um, these, these grand transitions um, can be achieved. And I think you very um, beautifully put the role that education can play in, in that particular process. Uh, I think everybody who's been here in the other meetings will have heard ADB's reorganized itself. We've got more money, we can scale up. And I think part of that is um, I think, Jill, um, thank you for coming today, by the way. And, um, Jill, I think you'll remember when you joined ADB, um, um, ADB used to call itself the family doctor, so the GP. More specialized, maybe more basic services. Jill, you, know, you can't do without it. Uh, with all this new money, with this new organization, um, coming back to Ramesh's call, bring the best global knowledge to DMCs, what we want to do is ambition, um, that we actually want to be of help to um, citizens in our member countries to scale up work on these grand challenges. So this can be done. Um, Finland is proof of that. We, we see the role of education in that. Um, I think Finland is, from my time at the um, um, European office, is uh, Finland is one of the few countries which has dedicated organizations which are there to share experience with um, our developing member countries, which is an enormously good opportunity, I think, given the obvious success factors that underlie it. One of the things I noticed, I think, in common between your presentation, Santa Maria, and Rima, is, you know, where did, so obviously this is a very knowledgeable process. Um, so it's not just ADB people sitting down with governments, but it's that respect for the teacher. You put T, capital T, um, self-learning by children. You know, 
um, Rima, you mentioned again, we need to listen to the experiences of your three million members on climate. So this is about mobilization. How do we tap this knowledge? How do we, um, for, this, for this great effect? And if I can just, la one last comment. Um, I was, thanks to our European office, I was actually in Helsinki a few, couple of months ago um, with a Korean colleague. Um, and he had grown up in a rural part of Korea. And to get to a good school, he said, this is at a dinner, which um, our Finnish host kindly put together. Um, he said he had to travel 100 kilometers every day to get to this prestigious school. 100 kilometers back, three hours sleep. And he actually said then, he said, you know, um, as a result, I don't want to have children. I don't want a child to go through this torture of three hours sleep, 200 kilometers commuting a day just for education. So if there's, if there's an answer out there um, for, you know, you succeed by putting less pressure on, somehow that we have to be able to garner that um, uh, message. So thank you very much, Santa Maria, for, you know, walking us through. The other thing is, if I noticed, and I remember right, you had 100 years of history and eight milestones. So that's every 12 years. Um, another very important lesson, I think, for me is, um, you know, don't have reforms every, every single year. It confuses everybody. Trust the system, trust people. A lot of trust, I think, is behind this. I think I'm talking too much, and I should go to our um, bio. If I could invite you to um, speak about the Mongolian experience. I think the Mongolian experience shows that you can transform a whole sector successfully. Um, and um, I'm going to tell one of, the lead, one of the lead architects to walk us through. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for nice introduction and uh, good morning to everyone and Kamarjuba to our Georgian hosts and friends. So, as uh, Robert said, I'm going to introduce about uh, health sector reform in Mongolia, so which we started in the beginning of 1990s, almost uh, 30 years ago. So. Uh, before, in the beginning, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about why we actually needed a reform of health sector in Mongolia. Uh, how I can move the slides? Sorry. Oh. So, uh, before 90s, as I mentioned, uh, we started reform of our health sector in the beginning of 90s. But before 90s, we had a very specific health sector, which was uh, uh, with, uh, with the full responsibility of the state for funding and delivery of health care. And the advantage of, one of the advantages of this system was that everyone had free access to at least basic health care. And uh, in terms of financing, exclusive tax-based financing was used with the input-oriented financing model. Input-oriented, I mean, we had a very rigid line-based budgets, uh, and uh, overall we had the dominance of uh, curative services over preventive approaches. And this led to the really excessive hospital sector uh, with a small uh, emphasis given for the primary health care. And uh, we had a very low efficiency because this, uh, despite very high number of acute hospital beds and doctors, we had uh, really not so good health indicators. I will talk about later, let's say, maternal mortality, child mortality. And since uh, we were a socialist country, we didn't have a private sector at all. And in terms of knowledge, I would like to say that uh, before 90s, we, we had a very limited access to international knowledge and practices, and it was restricted within the former socialist countries. And in the beginning of 90s, we had uh, really dramatic political changes, uh, which led to the transition from, uh, fundamental transition from centrally planned economy to market economy. And of course, with huge political and economic changes triggered a need for socioeconomic reforms 
including reform of the health sector. So, uh, on the next slides, I would like to highlight achievements of our health sector reform within the fine main areas. And uh, first, I will talk about what has been done in terms of reforming the health financing system. So, uh, in, in, be in the beginning of 90s, along with political changes, we had enormous uh, economic difficulties. Some sources say that we even had the collapse of our economy. And uh, the state cannot anymore fund the health sector operations as before. So I think the government needed an additional source of healthcare financing. And in 1993, we introduced the uh, health insurance system, which was really new for the country. And um, uh, we also, in terms of healthcare financing, made the transition from input-based model to output-based financing models. And uh, we introduced more efficient, uh, for instance, payment methods, like a capitation from primary health care, which was introduced from 1999, and uh, case-based payments from 2006. And recently, the reform is continuing. And uh, recently, we had a pooling of main sources of health care financing, which is a state budget and uh, health insurance fund. And now our health insurance general office acts as a single purchaser of health care and services on behalf of pooled and unified uh, uh, state budget and health insurance fund. Uh, I would say like health financing was, reform was, oh sorry, next slide. Side. Oh, I think I'm not moving it right. Excuse me, could you help me? <laughs> uh, uh, primary health care, health financing, uh, hospital reform. One slide is missing actually. Ah, this one. Yeah, thank you. So, um, in terms of, uh, so the reform of health, care, health financing sort of is a platform for reforms in other areas. So, we did a reform of primary health care and we established a completely new system of primary health care provision in our urban areas and we established uh, uh, family health centers as a private partnerships in the in the late 90s. And uh, in terms of provision of primary health care in our rural, rural, rural areas, we kept our old system of uh, sub-province health centers because we have a very vast territory with, uh, and, and even now still 30% uh, of our population lives in a nomadic way, as a nomadic herders in very remote areas. And our previous system of uh, sub-provincial health centers was really efficient in terms of reaching out to our remote population nomadic herders. We kept it, but uh, we tried to reform uh, and upgrade it, uh, for example, in terms of um, financing. And uh, in terms of primary health care, we are now moving to more uh, preventive approaches rather than giving an emphasis to creative services. And also in terms of financing, as I mentioned before, we introduced risk-based, uh, risk-adjusted per capita payments. And also lately we are uh, using uh, case-based payments for some services which are provided at the primary healthcare level. And just to conclude, we are trying to optimize our, our healthcare with allocation of more funding for primary healthcare uh, compared to the very excessive hospital sector. So, uh, uh, sector, uh, reform of primary health sector can go a standalone. So, we, we are also 
trying to reform our hospital sector. And as I already told, we are told we have a, we had a very excessive and inefficient hospital sector, and we are trying to rationalize it. And uh, uh, we are now we, the main problem is in the capital city, where half of our population lives. And our district hospitals uh, were not very efficient because we were providing very limited number of services. And now we are trying, uh, we are building and trying to introduce multifunctional general district hospitals. Uh, and uh, in terms of other areas of hospital reform, we are introduced licensing of health specialists, hospital specialists, and licensing and accredit accreditation of hospitals. And in terms of financing, we are using case-based uh, uh, financing using uh, diagnostic-related groups, which are regarded as more efficient compared to our previous model. And also to reduce the uh, number of acute beds and uh, unjustified hospital stays, uh, we are trying to promote day care, day surgery, and also chronic care. And uh, now the difference uh, with the situation before 90s as an uh, emergence and development of the private hospital sector. Uh, it's growing and of course we still need to introduce better regulation of the private sector. Please next slide. So next area is a patient safety uh, and uh, recently we had a really good upgrade of uh, our uh, mm, Blood, uh, uh, blood capacity in terms of blood collection, blood banking, and also we strengthened uh, our infection prevention and control at public hospitals, including surveillance of healthcare associated in infections, microbiology laboratory capacity, sterilization capacity, and medical waste management capacity. And these components are really essential for ensuring safety and quality of patients and also health service providers. And uh, we are giving also visitation because antimicrobial resistance becoming a really global problem worldwide. Uh, please next. Uh, in terms of medicine safety and regulation, we also had a fundamental change because our pharmaceutical sector including uh, production, import, haul, and retail sales were completely operated by the state. But in the 90s, we had a really collapse of the of system. So the government allowed the private sector uh, and privatized existing at that time uh, public pharmaceutical entities. And now all pharmaceutical sec sector in the country is in the private hands. So the state is trying to improve the regulation of medicines. And we were promoting good manufacturing practices. We are trying to, try to, trying to strengthen medicines, laboratory capacity. And uh, in terms of regulation of prices, we recently in introduced centralized procurement of medicines. But the main problem was uh, that our medicines regulation functions were really fragmented between di different institutions. So, Recently, we established a National Medicines Regulatory Authority, which is consolidating our medicines regulation. And uh, uh, in, uh, please, next slide. And in, this, in the previous slides, I tried to really highlight what was achieved as a part of our health sector reform. And on this slide, I would like to emphasize uh, ADB's role, because ADB was a really of a major uh, partner for the health sector in Mongolia. And uh, I think ADB's support for the health sector in Mongolia had a really big and positive impact with uh, really good outcomes and impacts. And why it had such a success, in my opinion, because uh, ADB support for health sector reform had a long engagement in continuity. The first technical assistance project was introduced in 1994. And it was 
were really consistent and aligned with long and medium term our national policies. And uh, one advantage of ADB support, I think, was it was uh, supporting systemic reform, big systemic reform, uh, and not really uh, limited within specific mandate or focused on a specific disease. And uh, ADB provided a good assistance in accessing best knowledge and practices, which we had limited access to. And the assistance was really comprehensive. And uh, like a planning of projects was really joined and consultative with the government. And uh, uh, continuous health sector development programs started in 1997 and continuing ongoing at the moment. And uh, to ensuring sustainability, uh, these reforms were reflected into the national policies and legislation. And they were, ADB was uh, one advantage was really responsive also to government's immediate priorities, like during the recent COVID pandemic. And also there was a really good flexibility in terms of project implementation, like uh, timely addressing the challenges and good coordination with other partners and development agencies which are active in the health sector, including like a World Bank, WHO, and UNICEF. And here, and, and here I would like to show you uh, the next slide, please, uh, just the main health indicators. And as a baseline, I put here data from 1990. And uh, as of 2022, we have a really good uh, progress in terms of reducing several times uh, child mortality and materni maternal mortality rates. And uh, I think I'm running out of time. And uh, the last slide, thank you. And uh, Mongolia is not only about the health sector. We have a very good landscapes, nice people. Please welcome <laughs> to Mongolia. Thank you. Madloba. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bayer, for again walking us through. I, th I think rather like um, with Finland, I think the Mongolian experience shows you can transform a system. 30 years, you talked about the, the long approach, the need for partnerships. Again, I, I think a common theme with all three presentations now is the need for partnership between different sectors of society. Um, in the 1990s, um, I worked in Mongolia. My salary was about $100 a month. It was, the, the economy was really uh, flatlining. Um, but I, I think, again, through quite a lot of dedication, um, the financing could be found for that particular system. So these things can work. In most of our developing member countries, you're going to find budgets are tight. Mongolia found a way to, again, go to the population, get things financed. Um, a lot of innovation, a lot of trust in the partnership. So, um, but I think, above all, mobilization. I mean, this was not just the government or ADB sitting together. This was, as you say, a whole array of partners, private sector, society, come together, align. You have a great result, as those statistics show. So thank you very much, Dr. Bayer. Um, Pilvi, could we please turn to you for the perspective from the European Union and on all the wonderful um, future work that you're doing? Thank you. First of all, uh, good morning, midday on my behalf, and perhaps to preach from the previous speakers. I actually have traveled through Mongolia in 1990s by train, and I had some history in my life working with the happiness curriculum in India, and I, I'm a Finnish citizen, so I had a Finnish uh, uh, historical background, actually, with Finnish education, so it would be very tempting to actually take this moment to comment, but as EU is one that always brings together European Union members and countries, I think this which serves for me to be here in this panel representative of the European Union and in particular here as a director of an agency called European uh, Training Foundation. I'll take you through a quick um, overview what is it actually that European Training Foundation is and does in particular in the role of knowledge, which is our theme and I understand this is a learning uh, session in that sense for us all. A uh, few words what we do with international financial institutions and I will close by there was an invitation for our speakers to also take some major trends we think are very important at the moment so I'll close with those. Uh, who are we? Um, 
European Training Foundation, although its name has a, uh, a training and foundation, in fact, we are not a foundation legally, we are an EU agency. So an implementing agency uh, office of the European Union in the field of education and training, but with a very particular element, which is the only EU agency supporting EU as a global actor. So in other words, we work outside the Union borders. Uh, neighboring countries to make most of their human capital through reform of education, training and employment uh, systems. We are 30 years this year, and I like to mention this as a director because a colleague of mine put it nicely, 30 is a prime age. So you have enough experience and history to know what you're doing, but you have enough ahead to be energetic about the future and also sort of bring that experience of yours uh, to the disposal of others. If there is something to take from the, what ETF is, it's a combination of geographical approach and thematic approach. This is our geography. So as I said, we are based there in Europe, in, in, in Italy, in Turin, but we work uh, globally, mainly something what we call neighborhood. Neighborhood reaching to east, up to Central Asia, to south, uh, up to Northern Africa and African Union. We worked uh, uh, since 30 years in about uh, 40 countries quite extensively. So to the question of the panel also that can knowledge and innovation travel when we talk about skills, education and training, I think the answer from the ETF perspective is yes, otherwise we would not be there after 30 years with this geography. Thematically, then, uh, this is really the key areas where we work. So improving the uh, education and training provision in the regions and countries, supporting employability of both youth and adults, so that comes reskilling, upskilling in particular. Very important at the moment, making the lifelong systems to work for everyone. So the element of inclusion, uh, uh, both in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of other aspects. And really uh, uh, anticipating more and more the skills needs for the future. Uh, taken also the transitions uh, we are currently facing, uh, uh, both digital and climate reasons. We are currently uh, working, there was a mention about the sort of strategic approach and new, new organization of the ADP. So uh, in the European context, um, EU, uh, European Union, has a seven-year uh, uh, financial framework period, the current one running from 21 to 27. So we as ETF follow that in our strategy, so we have a strategy up to 27, but we all know 27 is tomorrow, so we are also about to start to work towards Vision 2040, which is again an EU framework, the whole EU works with that uh, um, uh, a foresight uh, year in order to prepare for the next financial framework, which is then running from 28 to 34. But in our current, so 27 strategy, we divide our work into three services, which I think uh, uh, come to the heart of this panel as well. The first service being uh, a knowledge hub, where we uh, do analysis of skills, skills needs, skills anticipation, validation, and so on in the regions we work, but also beyond globally. Then there is the monitoring and assessment of systems. So what is happening at the moment? What are the developments uh, in particular in the countries where we work? And then based on these two sort of future orientation in the knowledge hub, and then the analysis of the systems, assessing them, uh, country intelligence, providing the third service, which is called policy advice. So that's policy advice and dialogue with countries, with regions, with institutions, uh, both uh, uh, in, our, in our partner countries, within the Commission, and with partners like the ADP. I learned recently, I thought, something which one would like to share in every panel uh, this year. A, a colleague, uh, a long-term uh, director of an EU agency elsewhere who is retiring, and he gave three points, and I'm not mentioning the two, but his third main message for everyone after 40 years of working, he said, was the 2020s must be, uh, uh, the, the power word must be collaboration because that's the only way we will actually manage with all the complexities we have in this world. And I think it's in this policy advice and dialogue where we try at ETF to bring really the co-creation together. If I stop just for a second for the Knowledge Hub, because that was also Robert's, in a way, invitation, 
So what do we do there? I, I run through a few examples, but before go to going to them, I would like to stress to the audience because I think there is this question of, you know, does it make sense to have this knowledge element when you, when you are doing investments? How do you measure impact? So we do measure the impact as well. And recently we measured the impact of our, uh, so what we call knowledge uptake. In other words, the knowledge we produce, how much is it utilized by those uh, stakeholders of ours that find it relevant. And it was around 75% the uptake. And we talk about a stakeholder group that is about three, 4,000 in different networks that we work closely with. So it seems that we've managed to target the knowledge also to those who actually work with us. Few examples of the knowledge, uh, knowledge work, knowledge hub work. First, knowledge through really very concrete practices and advocacy. Uh, I think that actually also the QR code works there. I'm not, I haven't tested, so I, I can't give my word, but you may be able to vote with it. Because ETF has been running, this is now a fourth year, something, uh, uh, a pioneer, I think, globally, uh, initiative called Green Skills Award. And here we receive every year hundreds and hundreds of applications globally, uh, and those really show the real concrete work in the field of skills, training, and education uh, 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 in different places. And just to give you a taste, last year the winner was a, a zero waste project in Lebanon. Two years ago, the third one was actually from India, an institution of vocational education working in the field. Currently, the, the vote is open for the 10 finalists of this year, so you get a taste of what type of things come across the globe through this kind of knowledge creation through practices. We do uh, knowledge uh, creation through capacity building. Here again, uh, for the sake of making things concrete and examples, you might wonder, like, what is she now talking about the scaffold? Do we start playing? Unfortunately, not here. But uh, this has proven to be a very useful tool for educators, again, in very different cultural contexts. It's translate, it, it's a, it's a 102 uh, cards on core competencies used by teachers and educators in very different parts of the world. For instance, in the Central Asia, translated into Central Asian languages. And bringing uh, tools for educators with the uh, uh, sort of um, to, to deal with skills uh, or future skills that are not necessarily part of the formal programs and their materials as they are. Uh, you can Google and you, you'll find that it's, at, it's sort of currently traveling very fast to the different parts of the world. Then we do, as said, a lot of uh, knowledge creation through co-creation. What seems to me a very effective way of working is uh, different types of networks. We have networks which around skills, skills labs, that's bringing together researchers and also practitioners around the world, uh, work of skills and future skills analysis. Skills for enterprises, so an, uh, an angle with enterprises. Networks for um, centers of excellence in vocational training that again, all have similar questions across uh, our partner countries and also globally, whereby asking that how do we actually have excellent results in vocational education, for instance, in digitalization and greening. So if I would package in one uh, sentence the knowledge uh, work of ETF, it would be sort of think global, act in context both geographically and thematically act in context. Then bringing us closer to today as a, 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 a meeting, so what is the cooperation with the international financial institutions? That is something we started actually developing a few years ago more intensively, simply because the recognized increased need for investments, including upskilling, that is really recognized globally because we see the diversification of the, of the skills development needs and the environment's targets, so you need that understanding. What is the role of skills as part of the investments in order for investments to be sustainable, efficient, and have impact? And for that impact, I would repeat what I said, the power magic word of this, this decade really should be uh, working in partnerships and in cooperation because that is the way for impact. And in order to analyze a little bit what the skills impact could be in working with financial institutions, we just are about to launch a publication where also Ramesh is one of the authors uh, in June together with the European Commission uh, where the title is, and I think someone already mentioned this, Is Money the Solution? A Dialogue with IFIs. And from the title, you can probably guess what the conclusion is, is money the only solution. 
where examples uh, for the areas of cooperation uh, where, uh, with actors like uh, ADP, I really think they are numerous, but here it just stays trying to package very, uh, uh, very in a summary way. So of course there is the knowledge sharing and co-creation element. Then very important, I think, there is the mobilization. Mobilization in different sectors, whether it's a public and private sectors, we have different audiences and different networks, or whether it's in the sectors of economy. So the mobilization uh, uh, at its best really makes one plus one to be much more than two. Then there is, of course, the monitoring and assessment element where, uh, where there is a lot of uh, 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 opportunities. And then the promotion of policy chains for impact. We have heard here examples of Finland or Mongolia, and I think then the question, of course, remains is that how do you then really uh, drive towards uh, uh, changes and for impact? And I can say from experience of ETF and also from some professional longer experience that we really see some of policies to travel. Let's take the example of youth guarantee of the European Union, which was actually designed in one of the member states, then became an EU policy and now is utilized in Western Balkans uh, in Ukraine uh, and, and, and so forth. We have an examples where the employment and education is brought together in skills agencies that then can take the format uh, of localized format, but inspiration uh, elsewhere. The, these really examples are numerous and I think worth looking, but with the evidence basis, of course. As ETF examples, just uh, 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 to mention uh, something that is in the region where we work uh, closely with the ADPs, a uh, uh, project that we do with the EU International Partnerships, DARIA, Dialogue and Action for Res <coughs> Resourceful Youth in Central Asia. And I think it's important to get the title, Dialogue and Action. And the dialogue happens here, for instance, in the level of a high-level group of ministers, of the five countries of Central Asia, and they are ministers both of employment and education, so not only one or the other. And that's how you then get the mobilization, of course, uh, 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 happening. And I've said many times evidence-based and monitoring, so then what we do in the sort of measure level, so measuring system performance uh, uh, to target the support. So here, as ETF is stationed in Torino, Italy, Torino process has been running over 10 years f with all the countries where we work, really uh, in, uh, improving the intelligence and developing therefore also indicators for the development of the lifelong learning systems and those to be then utilized as, as part of the policy uh, advice. So to close, uh, I was asked to insight on future trends. So the, we, with colleagues, had a little discussion back in Turin and we decided to bring three trends here. Of course, we have many mega trends. We all know we have a climate change, we have the geopolitical questions and so on. But now we try to concentrate on the topic of, of today. And there, uh, the first trend uh, we would pick would be the global education uh, agenda that really has become a, a joint endeavor. And here, there are some, uh, someone might be wondering, like, what, what, why is it important? Well, education has typically been a national realm. And therefore, it's been a bit difficult, for instance, multinational companies to find ways for upskilling, reskilling in a meaningful way because the systems are national. So now we had first in 22 a UN level summit for the world leader, for the presidents and prime ministers transforming education to be continued this year with the future summit in New York in, in, in September, demonstrating that this agenda is really picking up. And it's partly picking up actually because of the uh, 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 pandemic and the ability, digitalization and the platforms that have been created. And from our perspective, we really see this in the uh, technical and vocational education where these uh, centers of excellence, for instance, have started to work together in a very meaningful way. Had I been told 20 years ago, having been in this business for quite a while, that we see such a global sort of perspective to voc vocational education, I would not have believed, and it's important, I think, from the investment perspective. Then we have the second trend, uh, uh, the labor markets transformation, new forms of work and platform economy. I think we had a brilliant example here from India. I will not stop here m m more than that, but that's a trend to really be recognized in this discussion. And finally, the mobility of learners and workers. Uh, so to recognize the skills dimension 
of mobility and migration. Again, a, few, uh, a worldwide uh, trend in many ways problematic, but if addressed correctly, we can really, I think, find policies in, migra in the field of migration and skills that benefit us all and finally also our uh, economies. EU has currently uh, just passed a major package on that includes uh, uh, migration and countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan as a particular countries uh, uh, among, uh, among others. So my message would be uh, to getting ready for the future, to have future-proof skills development needs understanding of the demand, of the supply, of the gap, and then policies, and that we need to address that in collaboration. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Pilvi, for... Um, I think, um, I think, Pilvi, you have, um, the EU has, what, 28 member countries, I think it is now, and I guess not, um, not just Finland was a poor agrarian country at some point. So there's going to be a very rich reservoir of experience, which I think we can tap for our developing member countries. And I think it's wonderful that the EU has um, taken it upon itself to systematically share that experience. Again, some of the themes, um, cooperation, alignment, working across boundaries, and ambition. Um, we've heard that from, I think, from all speakers so far, the need to ambition, embrace complexity. Don't be scared of complexity. Embrace it. There are ways through. Um, for maybe Ramesh could invite you to um, share your perspectives on what we've Thanks. heard. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Robert. I'm going to be sitting here and speaking. Uh, I will please cut me in about six, seven minutes because about 40 plus people are here. It'll be really nice to get some insights. Uh, also recognize our former, talking about knowledge, we have our former Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Dr. Ursula. Um, lots to talk about, uh, bridge to the future, what does that mean? How do we position ourselves? ADB, as all of you know, uh, is a development institution, development bank, but we are also a knowledge uh, institution. Um, if you look at in money terms, there is lots of money. Obviously, the world needs, the developing, uh, particularly parts of Asia, needs a lot more uh, money. But if you look at the resources that we have, about 3,000 plus staff resources, um, they're all storehouses of knowledge. All of us have knowledge in this room. Uh, how do we use the tacit uh, knowledge that we all have built up uh, the practical knowledge that is there in implementing uh, hundreds of projects over the last uh, about 60 years or so, how do we use it for the benefits of our developing member countries has always been a perennial challenge. How do you capture knowledge? What do you learn from it? How do you assess what you've learned? How do you ask what you know, what you don't know? And how do you take it to our developing member countries? So we've been spending a lot of time on uh, how do we really, you know, what is knowledge? How do we invest in that knowledge? How do we take that knowledge to uh, developing member countries? There are fascinating insights that um, uh, our other speakers have provided in many different areas, gender, climate, livelihoods. Uh, you have um, uh, education leading to prosperity that Sana Maria presented, uh, the health sector as a case in Mongolia, and uh, training and skills development at a broader level and uh, future-proofing, which is going to be very, very important in terms of thinking about uh, building bridges uh, to the uh, future. If you look at Asia and Pacific, I think many of you may be familiar with the famous uh, Angus Madison graph, uh, economic historian uh, who um, you know, went back about 350 years, if I remember the numbers correctly, in looking at um, uh, how GDP evolved. Obviously, GDP is a um, this century's concept. Uh, but he had gone back and constructed data uh, for the then Indian subcontinent, China, uh, what was the New World then, and um, Europe, and so on. Um, in, in the 16th century, um, Asia contributed more than 50% of global GDP. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, lots of other parts of the world uh, overtook Asia. And, and there are lots of challenges, but at the same time, lots of opportunities. But looking ahead, we have lots of potential and promises. Again, uh, the uh, long-term growth trends we are seeing, for example, you know, with the sustained and robust growth of Asia and Pacific, uh, Asia and Pacific will become a very important region in the future. So lots of promises and potential, but how do we really build bridges to this future? Uh, obviously, knowledge is going to be very, very critical. 
And what does a bank like the Asian Development Bank do? By the way, any of you are uh, interested on what we do in sectors, I've got a, a few QR code cards. I'll request my colleague to uh, Akapol to keep it and we, we will share with you if you would like to take. Um, but this, these are snapshot presentations of what we do. Uh, now, there is climate challenge. Rima talked about, and, and I think also the, uh, the, the, the cold country uh, challenges that you talked about, and we've got challenges of that type as well in developing Asia uh, in, in terms of uh, glacier melt, uh, for example, that we are seeing, or extreme heat. In fact, a couple of days ago, I think it was in this room, we had a, an ADB evolution seminar. The U.S. head of delegation started the, her panel discussion with a question, can anybody guess what is the heat index in Bangkok last week? Uh, and most of us in the room said in the 40s, but it is 52. In the Philippines, uh, we've never had temperatures, I've been living there for 27 plus years, we've never had temperatures of like above 40. It is 46. What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with it? So you have climate crisis. You have nutrition crisis. Uh, in one of the seminars we, we hear, I think also in this room, 450 million people are malnourished in Asia and Pacific region. What do we do? What kind of knowledge do we create for them? And you've got learning crisis. Uh, I think Finland, you've got uh, the one extreme which has done exceptionally well in PISA scores. Uh, but you've, you've got countries in developing Asia which are at the bottom of the, uh, at the ladder in terms of PISA. What do we do? And I think, uh, Robert, in your intro, you mentioned there is a lot of pressure. Is that what is creating? Is that, is that competition? Obviously, lack of resources, lack of continuous teacher training, uh, teacher upskilling, and so on, a whole host of uh, problems. So how do we really position ourselves and, and um, uh, position for today and position for uh, the future? In the ADB context, we have the new operating model uh, which has been under implementation for the past uh, about a year or so. Uh, we are looking at this very, very closely and carefully. Obviously, lots of complexities involved. Uh, one thing that always comes out is that knowledge, obviously, is universal. You, you, you know, we can learn from so many things. But how do you apply that knowledge in a practical sense matters a lot. Context matters. Uh, what is applicable to one situation may not be applicable to others. So from, a, uh, you know, ADB is called the harness broker, family doctor. How do we really bring all this knowledge together and use for the benefit of the countries? One, uh, one particular issue in climate transition we are working on is energy transition. Um, looking at uh, brown assets or coal-fired or dirty assets in the energy space. You can shut down coal plants in some countries, but you cannot do that in, you know, across the board because energy security is very vital. We are learning a lot from this. How do we translate this knowledge? How do we come up with uh, innovative solutions, financing solutions, and so on? The uh, Pilvis uh, mentioned a reference to future proofing is so critical. Lots and lots of things are happening. Dy the, the region is dynamic. There, there is a lot of global dynamism. But we also have lots of challenges. So how do we really future proof uh, the various uh, sectors and the interventions where we are investing is going to be very critical as well. In the ADB context, we are bringing in foresight thinking, and I'll mention just a few areas that we are looking at moving beyond uh, what one may call in the development banking landscape as kind of bread and butter type of things. You know, of course, uh, many uh, countries, particularly low-income countries, will continue uh, requiring basic investments like, you know, roads, bridges, and so on, basic education, and so on. But many also need, even countries at the lowest income levels, they want more innovation. They want more innovative solutions. Uh, now, clearly, so the second generation or the third generation of development projects that we are looking at are obviously going to be much more complex, much more intersectoral in nature. Uh, let me just mention a few things uh, to, to um, highlight what we are looking at. Transforming Asian food systems. How are we going to feed these 450 million undernourished people? And, and you're looking at billions of people. How are we going to ensure that we do not face food insecurity as we faced in, in, uh, in, in the recent years? Boosting coastal resilience is another area which has become immensely complex. Adaptation and resilience has always been complex. What, are, what is emerging? What is the new knowledge that is emerging? What, what is it that we can do? Uh, decarbonizing various sectors. You know, we talk a lot about uh, climate change. If you take global health as a country, 
It is country number four in terms of GHG emissions. Health sector contributes 5% of the globe, total greenhouse gas emissions globally. Um, take um, you know, another sector, maritime sector, which we are looking at now quite closely in, the, uh, in uh, recent months. That is country number five. In if you look at the construction industry or manufacturing and construction put together, it's actually country number one in terms of GHG emissions. So over 22% of GHG emissions come from uh, these sectors. Asia and Pacific contributes more than 50% of GHG emissions. Uh, how, do we, how do we really position ourselves? So we are looking at a whole host of hot to abate sectors, critical mineral supply chains, uh, or, or another um, you know, elements that uh, we need to look at, so on and so on. Now, all of this needs um, intelligent ideas. We need to invest in skills, skills for green economy. Um, it also needs money. Fiscal space has become constrained in the post-pandemic context. Uh, ACOPOL has been working hard on domestic resource mobilization in many countries. How do we uh, really create more space, keep that space expanded so that the multiple competing priorities uh, can be met? So finally, in conclusion, what, what are we looking at in terms of the challenges? Now, looking at it from ADB point of view, uh, no one institution, no one country can solve these problems alone. We need partnerships. Uh, so, you know, working with, with various partners that uh, are represented here, working with scores of countries, development partners is going to be very, very critical. Uh, so we need to obviously invest in education and skills, but what is knowledge? How do we ensure continuous learning? What is the, what is the role of private sector here? Now, particularly, you know, in terms of moving from informality that uh, Rima talked about, going into if, if economies can be formalized, then what is the role of private sector in terms of ensuring uh, or, or private actors, uh, broadly defined civil society, NGOs, and so on, in terms of ensuring that uh, there is continuous learning uh, from whatever we do. In many developing countries, we continue to have degree bias. You need to have a diploma. You need to have a piece of paper in your hand. But is the world going to be like this? Uh, how are we going to be investing in continuous knowledge uh, is going to be there. What, are, uh, the, uh, what is the efficacy of different models here, publicly funded, privately funded models? How do we really make sure that there is adequate quality uh, and, and, and uh, agility in the systems also is something we need to look at. Uh, Santa Maria and ourselves, we were talking about um, uh, earlier this week, countries are now not investing adequately in education. Uh, for health, uh, probably there are mandates, there are universal health care mandates. Some countries have constitutional spending minimum uh, on education, but clearly education spending is not adequate. How do we make sure that that does not precipitate learning crisis is something we need to look at. Uh, and finally, the role of disruptive technologies. Uh, is, is probably of paramount importance. How do we really use digital, digitalization and digital uh, skills are going to be very, very critical. Let me pause, Robert, at least we have a few minutes. Uh, I think we should open the floor and uh, it will be great to get any insights uh, from the audience. Thank you so much. Yes, um, thank you very much. Thanks for all the interventions. And I think we have time, maybe just a couple of questions. Um, if we could start with one, um, given the wide income and budgetary disparities between developed countries, um, including Finland, and developing Asian countries, is it realistic to assume that what works in Europe can work elsewhere? Um, and then there's a the second part of the question, could the principles that make the Finnish education system successful be applied to good effect in other countries? Um, Rima, do you think you could take that one? Can, can what works in Europe work, for example, in the countries where SEWA works? I can definitely try because, you know, it's a small country, a happy country. Um, I come from a large country, 1.4 billion people in my country. And, but I think definitely, you know, uh, uh, one needs to reduce the burden on the children who are going to be our future citizens. And I think that's what one needs to learn. And that's where I think, you know, bridging the knowledge um, together. So how do you reform the education system? How do you integrate life skills into the education system? And what Ramesh just said of degree bias. And I think we need to move away from that. But, you know, no skill should go redundant. And I think uh, every skill should be given equal weightage. 
And that's what I think uh, one could learn from the experience of Finland and bring it to countries like ours as well. So definitely, I think there's a lot that one can learn. Uh, thank you very much, Reem. And I think there's another question related to what you've just said. Um, so in, the age, in an age of technological advancements, including in the sphere of education and learning, to what extent do you think developing Asia and the Pacific can benefit from their advent? And how important do you think the human factor will still remain? So with all this tech AI stuff coming through, um, you know, I think it's probably, I know Finland's very strong in ed tech, for example, but if you move to a, let's say, a poorer development country in Asia, can that be of benefit? Maybe Santa Maria, could you take that one? Sure, thank you, um, Robert. Yes, indeed, uh, digitalization is is uh, one of the the, the, the the key questions uh, nowadays, and I think our approach to that, and of course, it needs all the supporting infrastructure first. It needs access, you know, to digital devices and all all that. But my point there was also that you know, smart digitalization actually helps learning as well. We have cooperated, for example, or we continue cooperation uh, for, well, with India, but with Mongolia as well. And there with some of the uh, educational, pedagogically proven digital learning material, we have been able to increase together uh, learning results in mathematics by uh, 40%. And there, there has been also the support uh, for teachers and also the support uh, for the uh, education you know, administrators to actually show where can be some of the learning gaps. And here I would like to mention also special needs. And there are you know, solutions for that that actually help us to also see where are some of the gaps and how do we in an impactful and meaningful way address those. So uh, I think there's a lot we can also learn uh, you know, from that uh, technology and, of course, human then being there in the front, uh, leading that as well. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Santa Maria. And um, maybe, Baya, could, could you um, respond to that question on digitalization? Um, just actually this morning, um, we were discussing with Rima the interest to have telemedicine. And I told the story how we had a um, great telemedicine um, project in Mongolia. And I, I don't know if you were there, but that one time when we were given it, somebody had appendicitis or something like that. And we, would, we were able to watch his operation live um, as a surgeon from Ulaanbaatar joined um, and guided a doctor in a rural area in a very remote place. So I, didn't, I don't think he expected to be observed by ADB people while this was happening, but um, you know, these things happen. But Mongolia is very gung-ho on, on digital. Now, where do you see that? Is it something um, where you, know, you would see that as a central area of your response to keep your health indicators improving? Thank you for the question. And I think, yes, uh, digitalization is uh, really important in the health sector as well. And as you already mentioned, we have a quite uh, good uh, telemedicine project. Uh, and uh, it is really important in a country like Mongolia, because as I mentioned before in my presentation, we have a very vast, big territory, sparsely located population in many provinces. And, uh, uh, and one thing is that all of our, uh, let's say, tertiary hospitals, for instance, they are located in the capital city. So, and many people have to travel to seeking with tertiary services from the capital city. But uh, telemedicine provides an uh, to get uh, counseling and uh, support in terms of diagnostic and treatment of of uh, diseases, which uh, usually without with telemedicine, we, we have to be referring to the capital city. And also, not only health sector, now in Mongolia, we are really having a big digitalization uh, reform. And recently, uh, we have a new ministry on communications and digitalization uh, leading with reform. And health sector actually is a part of this reform. And uh, I think in terms of, uh, I'm, I can only talk about the health sector, keeping up with, with digitalization will be, I think, a foundation for successful implementation of new technologies and development in the health sector as well.
not in the accelerator for digitalization, we're not going to be making a mistake in ADB. I, I think that that sounds like very much. So maybe maybe one last question, and apologies to Ramesh and to Bayer. Um, for the women on the panel, what advice do you have for female leaders, other female leaders, to combat sexism and discrimination in the workplace to close the gender gap, especially in developing areas? Maybe, Pilvi, could you take this one? Um, as, as part of, um, if it's related to the work of ETF, how do you just... How would you think about this one? Well, I, I could take it for, uh, through an example. So again, I, I think the, we always need to sort of look at the, the what do we know, what is the evidence, and how do we then address that. So we've done, for instance, some studies in uh, North African countries about the migra uh, migration uh, and the women uh, in migration, both leaving the country but also returning. And what is their actually position in this world of migration and how does their skills set either protect or may actually make them subject to uh, 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 misuse, for instance. So I think if I can just broaden, therefore, because I think actually these questions should be directed to probably other gender in the panel, but if I broaden it a little bit, that when looking at, I, I think the sectoral approach can be also quite helpful in these kind of questions. So sectoral meaning sectoral in, in terms of the sectors of economy. So you have very different situations, of course, in different uh, uh, fields from agriculture to health uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to maritime. So again, you can't generalize before you know the certain sector and what are really the issues there and what the uh, both genders may face. Then you have the sectoral element of the finance, employment and education when we are ac addressing again, the, for instance, the skills issue. So the education formal systems may be quite advanced in many ways while you have, for instance, the certain informal uh, employment uh, 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 sectors that are not too protective, neither minorities nor, for instance, women's rights. So let's say for, even we are saying the formal education systems cannot necessarily answer to our skills needs, but they are pretty well advanced in actually providing, for instance, protection and providing it also for, for women. And then we have the third, of course, sectoral element, still the public and private. And again, uh, the public sector, by definition, typically is by law already required certain measures, which you not, don't necessarily always and in all contexts have everywhere in the private. So I would always call for a, a bit more sectoral approach also in this question. Otherwise, we end up probably generalizing a bit too much. But I do think uh, we had the example now from India that empowering people and recognizing and validating their skills if we are in the field of knowledge and skills is really among the keys when we look at the development uh, uh, of the women workforce and uh, the uh, participation in society uh, more broadly. Yeah. yeah, very nicely put, Pilby, thank you. And we have maybe one very last question, if you don't mind um, going on for a couple of minutes, is um, a very ADB specific question. So um, Ramesh, if you could feel this one. Um, we've heard a lot about the cooperation and the need to, or the need to cooperate with the private sector. Um, given ADB's um, biases towards the public sector, is this something that you are confident that um, ADB can take on to work more closely with the private sector? Yeah, thanks, Robert. The answer is yes. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, give a couple of dimensions to this. But before that, on the previous question, uh, I think you know, equal pay for equal work has to be unequivocal. Uh, it's there in our ADB policies when we work with countries in terms of support we provide. It's a pity Sam, uh, Samantha Hong, who's our gender uh, chief, she was here uh, un until a few minutes ago. Uh, would have been nice to hear her perspectives as well. I think this is something that, that we uh, all certainly in our development work we should be promoting. There are obviously, as you said, there are um, contextual differences, sectoral differences and so on, but this is something very, very critical. There are many, many other aspects in terms of sexism, for example, uh, what are the elements be going beyond pay? For example, non-pecuniary uh, discrimination that you, uh, that you face, obviously we need to address all of that. On the private sector one, two dimensions. Uh, it is true, ADB's uh, lending, sovereign lending currently is the dominant form. It's about roughly the order of magnitude is about 80, 82 um, percent for sovereign and, and about, uh, you know, 17, 18 percent private sector. But in, and in the human capital space, uh, it is probably even lower. Uh, so this is something we are looking at. There are 
Um, broadly, human and social development defined there are more opportunities where private sector can come in, ADB's private sector that is, and we can also leverage more private investments. Uh, in fact, in, in our uh, discussions with some members of the panel, we've been talking about it over the last uh, few days as well. The second aspect is in terms of the enabling environment work, the sovereign work that we do, uh, how can we have private sector be involved more in skills provision? Uh, so there are various you know, benchmarking type of things that you can do. Uh, and uh, there are fantastic experiences, particularly from parts of Europe uh, that uh, developing Asia can learn from in, in terms of, particularly if, if you're looking at continuous, you know, on the job learning, skills development and so on, what are some of the practical models that have emerged and been successful that uh, Asia and Pacific can follow is something that we are looking at quite actively as well. And a very specific dimension of this is the digital skills, which is going to be immensely critical. A uh, study that, a couple of studies that we've done recently, uh, one at the height of the pandemic and one now more recently a few months back. For now, it gives comfort, these studies give comfort that digitalization itself is not going to pose major threats in terms of some of these jobs not you know, being lost. But is that going to be a continuous phenomenon? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I think clearly we all, every sector, every imaginable aspect of our economies needs to be looking at this. And this is something public sector alone will definitely not be able to do. Private sector has a big role to play. But uh, a challenge for develop development banks like us, how do we really leverage that private action uh, coming to the fore is very critical. You know, through, if you're looking at investments, through guarantee type of instruments to facilitate risk mitigation so that private sector can come and invest more, but also through other means, enabling environment, advocacy, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh. And um, I think we've gone a little bit over time, and thank you very much for tolerating my poor timekeeping. But thank you, thank you so much to come and um, spend the time with us, and I think for what was an, an extremely educational and um, um, you know, very, very knowledge-rich discussion. So thank you very much to our panel also for really sharing that wealth of experience. It's very kind. And there is a burning question in the audience, and <laughs> I believe everyone can also leave, because we promised that I think in the beginning. Yeah, my question is addressed to Ms. Tosti, more informational rather than anything else. Um, what exactly are you doing by way of training across the Asia-Pacific region? Uh, Europe, obviously, you know, part of the European Union, but I'd like to know what you're doing outside of it. Yeah. The, if I may, yeah. uh, the, well, the, the whole agency actually was founded to work outside the European Union, but it's, it's a little bit of a historical context, so it was in 1990s, right after the collapse uh, of the Soviet Union, and uh, the, therefore also new countries emerging in Europe that were looking towards the EU membership. So that's how the, uh, the, the work started, working with the employment and education systems of those countries that were moving closer to the European Union and later on becoming members. So that's the DNA that has continued, and the map that I had in my presentation was to illustrate how the map then has enlarged over 30 years and of course this experience of working on education and employment towards more prosperous societies, better lifelong learning systems taken into account the needs of the digital and, 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 and green skills is what we do. And, and in, in, uh, uh, mostly it is working with governments, so advising ministries of education, of employment, uh, hopefully more and more of finance in their strategies in, based on the experience on one hand and based on the knowledge and the future analysis, the future-proof skills mentioned now many times, of course, becoming more and more important, in particular for countries that are, one I visited recently, for instance, Egypt. There is a new strategy, both in employment and in education, targeting the youngest generations of whom about 10% are migrating elsewhere. In Central Asia, the Daria does quite a broad, so it does analysis of both education and employment system in the Central Asian countries with their respective ministries of employment and education, and on the highest level, which I think is important, because of course the ultimate goal is also to foster the cooperation benchmarking, and that's what I think is happening. So that's in a nutshell, in a very short format. Thank you. By the way, a plug for 2025 May, Next year's annual meeting will be in Italy, so you all can visit the ETF. By the way, we are already thinking about doing a 
a joint seminar between ETF and ADB on future-proofing skills development. So it would be a good opportunity. Great. Oh. Thank you very much again. So session closed. Thank you. Should have recorded so my colleagues will say to me this was not in your notes, but we appreciate it. <laughs>